So, thank you for having me today. Um, I'm really happy to be here. Lighthouse is a place which I think does fantastic things. And just to say at the beginning, I, yes, I do. I work for an institution. I work for one of the biggest theatre companies in the world. But I belong to an art sector. And I belong to a community of artists. And I think that artists are entrepreneurs. I think they're some of the best entrepreneurs that we have. And what I want to do today, as we talk about new platforms, as we talk about the change in direction in all our infrastructure and how that's affecting our every day, I want to sort of pan out a little bit and give us a little bit of perspective and to reassure us in certain areas, but then to also look at the opportunities and the changes we might need to make together and how actually some of the answers are there already for us and some of the things we're doing are already brilliant and actually about the artistic practice is about asking the right questions and making sure that the questions you ask are put out there in the world in the right way whether that's a frame whether that's a canvas whether that's a film whether that's a performance it's the contextualization of the conversation that you want to have with the world that's important and often we go this person over here has been really successful why are they doing it and why can't i have a piece of that and it's not about that it's about know your strengths and like yourself your weaknesses and know that what we're part of we don't work in isolation so my role at the Royal Shakespeare Company is to look at the past, the present and the future. I'm looking at the next generation, I'm looking at new ways of interpreting Shakespeare, I'm looking at new artists, I'm also considering artists from different places, technologists, coders, programmers, creators, creative people. But there are things from our past that can inform our future and actually when we pare it down sometimes we're talking about tools and maybe artists in the 15th century might have used these tools in similar ways. So Shakespeare is the right, our writer in residence, but we also work with lots of other writers. And Shakespeare was an entrepreneur. He did pretty well what he did, those words. They're still going today. And it's those themes of those plays. It's the, again, it's the questions that those plays explore and ask ourselves. And it's about us as contemporary practitioners, how we frame those debates in our society. So um, he's often a good person um, for me to remember when we uh, look at the next generation. But my favourite piece of interactive art is actually from the 15, 1533, and it's Holbein. And it's just a really good leveller, because what Holbein was doing here, um, in this really grainy, awful picture from Google, Google Images, and I apologise for that, but... <laughs> Um, what, what, this was, what this piece was doing was um, absolutely fantastic because it was looking at innovation and this was a brilliant time of innovation. So much was changing, globalisation was happening and we were looking at ourselves as a country out of context with, and having trade routes were starting and we were starting to understand ourselves in a, in a different cultural way. And so we have the loot here and we have the globe here, all these things of learning. But the fear in society at that time, the thing that people weren't talking about was mortality. We couldn't solve that. We have all these brilliant, amazing things and we still were going to die. We're still not going to make it and it's still a problem. And so what happens in this painting is that you can't see this skull. The only time you can see it is when you can't see the rest of the painting. And it was positioned in such a way that it crept up on you. It's interactive. We have to interact with this piece of art to make this work. And if we look at the tools that we have today, we are amplifying that so much around that. But it's the question, it's what matters, it's how you get into the heart of the person experiencing your work. And it's the same in performance design. I realise that I'm coming from a different artistic background today, many of you are filmmakers. Um, but there are similarities here. And, if, um, and in performance design in Shakespeare's day and shortly after, there were these things called masks. And they were about innovation. They were about doing the most ambitious staging craft of theatre. And we have documentation from that time about um, how the king could only experience the whole of the play and everyone around him were just getting moments and glimpses. And this particular picture is uh, design um, of Inigo Jones, who was a, who was a really famous uh, designer at the time. And we have documentation that says... Can audiences wear mirrors and jewellery so that the candle lights glimpses off it? And that just says to me wearables. 
Do you see what I mean? It's just different terminology. We've done it before. And we'll do it again. And what today we do, whatever you do in your practice today, someone's going to do it in 10 years' time, in 100 years' time. And again, it's just understanding that we're not working in isolation. But what we have is a brilliant new world, a digital age that we all sit in, live in, and are part of. If we want to opt out, we can opt out. If we want to opt in, we can. It's our choice. But think about the questions that you want to ask. So, let's get to today. These are devices to tell stories. Yes, you can say they're phones, yes, you can say they're laptops and tablets, but they're your devices to tell your story. And the different distribution models are is that anyone's got these in their bag at any point, so your stories can get to people anywhere, anytime. And so how people connect with your work has changed. It's not just an appointment to view anymore. It's not just being told that you, you go there at a certain point. Your work can be more agile if that's the right place for it to be. And if we change the terminology of these pieces of steel or plastic or whatever they are, we change that terminology, make them creative things, then they are fact. And that's what we need to start thinking about. So um, in 2013, that was a premise for a project we did called Midsummer Night's Dreaming. And we performed a play live and online over the internet for three days. And Midsummer Night's Dream lasts for three and a half hours in the sense of the play. In the real world of that play, it lasted three days. And so we played with that. What would a piece of theatre look like on the internet? There were lots of mistakes. There were lots of brilliant things. Um, but we had so much learning. But we also wanted to see what does the internet look like for this thing to experience? And so we turn these, what we said, these are devices to tell stories. And that's where we started. Um, I noticed on some of the things that we're talking about today are about how do you get your audience with you? How do you grow that audience, that perceived audience where you see lots of people having those big um, reaches and we talk about those statistics in this really abstract way, don't we, where you go, number of hits equals success. And that value framework you need to be really careful with in the arts. But just because you get a million hits, does that make it beautiful? Does that make it amazing? Um, and one thing that I've really thought about is, it's not about audiences necessarily, it's about community, it's about tribes. And so how, on social media, how many of you follow people you don't like? <laughs> oh, you do, okay. Be, can you get what I'm saying? Um, so think about that for a minute and think, are they the people that you want to connect with? Are they, are they the people that you really, when we talk about reaching your audiences, are we just perpetrating the same cycle? So when we think about our work, what are the communities that you want to engage with? Who are the tribes? How do they operate? And it's not about setting up, you know, it is about setting up those things, but it's not, that's not enough. Go out there, listen, watch, engage with what the world is talking about. And like, you may not like it all the time, but if you want those reaches, if you want that engagement, if you want your world, to, your world to enter into that world, go and see them. Your work online is not a landing platform for people to arrive at. That's a significant shift in this work, is we are a networked culture now. We're not platform landing points. Our theatres have changed. Our cinemas have changed. We need to show the strengths of our <coughs> to go to a place together. And we also need to know that in the agile space on the internet, it's lighter, quicker, sharper. If you can get your content into those highways, into those communities, they're sharing it for you. So that's where the impact is clearer. So on the project we did in 2013, the RSC didn't talk about it. Shakespeare did. Because Billy Shakespeare is much more <coughs> palatable and interesting to a different community that we wouldn't normally reach. And so Billy Shakespeare had his own identity, had his own social media page, he had his own conversation, he went and talked to other people on the internet said, I really like what you're doing, then we'll see what I'm up to, and started a conversation as a person. The more personal, the more connected, the more real you are, 
the more people. Um, <laughs> can I just say, Billy Shakespeare was a woman for six weeks. <laughs> Slightly had feminine tendencies, but that's fine. But you know what I'm saying? It's like it's about the imagination, and in, in, in your in, a, in an artistic practice, if you say Billy Shakespeare exists, he exists doesn't matter. But with the RSC, it's a different conversation that you're going to enter into. So it's not marketing, it's about community. And the significant shift now is that our audiences are makers, and they feel they can make, and they have tools to make. And there's a sort of, how do we get the value of our work out there? How do professional practitioners get that value framework? And I think it isn't, it's about not ignoring this community that can work with you and can be creative and that you might spark something off. And in um, the play that we performed on the internet, we released 3,000 pieces of content. So a piece of content every five minutes about the play over those three days. A thousand of which were made by real people. And we welcomed them, we wanted that. We couldn't assess it, we didn't know about the quality of that. That didn't matter, but with one hashtag it unified us all. We were in that play together, and that was what it was about. But when we talk about audience of, as makers, what we need to be is genuine about what we're asking them to do. And sometimes that could be an opportunity, and sometimes that might not be what you want, but it's an option that you have. So at the RSC, I've been commissioning different types of artists to work with us. We have had a brilliant playwright for the last 400 years, and we work with playwrights. But there are also another phase of artists that we found out on the Midsummer Night's Dreaming project that were really essential, and that work works really well online. Visual artists, whether you're an animator, or a filmmaker, or a, someone that just crafts a beautiful image, the visual standing out of your work, appearing on a social media feed, is absolutely wonderful, and getting that visual identity out there was something that we played with. In terms of writers, of the people that could work with a team that could work quick, they were agile. Play takes a long time to, to come into existence and, and what we wanted was maybe a TV writer or someone that was used to being part of a collaborative moment. Right, that just changed us and that welcomed a new body of thinking, welcomed a new body of um, artistic ideas into, into our world, which we were really delighted with. It's a picture of Brendan Dawes here, he's wonderful. He's a technologist, he'd never been to Shakespeare before, he'd never seen a Shakespeare play. And what he did as a mini commission on a separate project was he wrote um, to be today and he created a, a, a whole spreadsheet of Shakespeare quotes, tagging words against them and then linked it to the BBC News API. So there's a Twitter feed, but instead of getting the headline, you get the Shakespeare quote. It's just a nice shift, nice nuanced shift. That's what it's about, just getting us to think differently. And that piece of work I still come back to is it's not a massive, grand piece of work. It's just a nice shift that he could bring to us and that we gave him just a different space to play as an artist. So yeah, it's about your content, your content creators. And what we found on the project and how I want to share our learning today with you is that basically for us, Midsummer Night's Dreaming was an innovative project that was a big experiment for us. We were learning new things. And one thing that was really important was how do we value the content creator and IP and their and all their all that. And so we had lots of internal conversations about that and we're trying to find a way. And how I couldn't say to an artist, I no one I can't guarantee someone not remixing and using it and all that type of stuff. And so we needed to work out frameworks to protect the artist, but also to be really clear what this project was about, who's it for, what it was doing. And I think as practitioners, whether you're an artist or any sort of content creator, just a more transparent conversation about the value of our work is really important. And that there might be um, traditional formats of commissioning that have happened in the past, but those things are changing. And we're all learning and we've all got to push that together. Um, but this was, um, just to give you a sense from the play, this was feeding the moon, and then we had the moon talking on social media. And in the play, the moon is like the barometer. And that's all the moon did. As you can see, the visual identity of that standing up on the social media, it was just beautiful. And if you got into the rhythm of the play, it was just a character that was talking to you. One of our 
And what is that image of the moon? Is it, a, is it actually a photograph of it? It's paper, layers of paper and paper. It's just, okay. just an it's, artwork. It's just an artwork, yeah. But one of the most popular characters in the play, there's a character called Snug. And we didn't change a line of Shakespeare, so what happens is this, we created new characters that talked about the play. So the line we give you is, imagine if you've gone to a party, well, no, imagine if your friends have gone to a party, but you can go and you hear about it through Facebook and Twitter. So it's about living vicariously and how the internet makes us feel as if we've done something when we haven't really. It's that knowingness about ourselves. We feel we know so much more just by listening and watching people's social media feeds. And Mrs. Snug basically follows Snug and, and there's a line in the play where it goes, Snug will play the lion. And so she writes, oh my God, Snug will play the lion. And, and actually we've got a, a young designer then, she started designing his costume and you've got little updates of the design over the days. It's just lovely to just work with designers who we work with all the time in a, in a different way. Mm -hmm. So what we also should remember is that we're not working in isolation on the internet. The internet isn't over there and live isn't over there. What we've got are meeting points that we need to make sure that we come back to. And as I say that the play was performed live, by RSC actors at the time of the at the time in the play it should have been performed. <coughs> we started in Theseus's court at 8 pm on a Friday night. <coughs> the actors didn't perform the scenes in the forest till 2.30 in the morning on Sunday. <laughs> yeah, we didn't sleep for three days. <laughs> it was a very small team and I can't tell you how I, I can't look at an Excel spreadsheet in the same way after that. It was the most enormous spreadsheet I've ever seen. Um, but there's something that shifts that, the lines and the performance, knowing that there's something out there responding to that, is really important. And we mustn't look at the online platforms in isolation, it's the liveness and the connectedness as well that's also important and how we route that. We shouldn't forget that. Which leads us to co-creation again. Audiences make us feel there's something about co-creation, being together. And, um, we actually experimented in this space, and I would um, underline this is, wasn't a traditional play for us. We didn't do this in the Royal Shakespeare Theatre, we did this in a rehearsal studio performance, but we let people keep their mobile phones on and their tablets and upload scenes and share what they were feeling about the performance while it was happening. And it was a discussion for us, the tech community, when I don't understand why you don't let people use their mobile phones, it's ridiculous, you should be more future thinking. The arts community is like, I'm not sure. And then when it got in the real world, flipped. Mm -hmm. Arts community is like, this is brilliant. Mm -hmm. And particularly the academic community were like, this is fantastic, I know what's coming up. I'm gonna, I'm, this is my play, I'm gonna share my bit of this play. And the tech community was like, it's a bit of a barrier. So we should be really careful that what the exceptions are, we should try that out because we shouldn't assume anything about our audience. Our audience have always been risk takers, they've come with us, they've experimented with us, they're fearless and we shouldn't assume that they don't want something, we should let them decide, let them use it. If they reject it, that's fine, they'll move on, they're not as sentimental as, as we think they are sometimes. <laughs> but what was great about this is through the hashtag people were sharing their moments and for me this is broadcasting but it's the people's cup, it's the people's choice of the scenes of our play that they chose, and that for me is really significant and interesting. The power that your audiences have now is huge, and what you can do together is really interesting, and they have an interpretation of your work. So when we go back and talking about remixing it, changing it, they're actually part of you and your work, and you can keep that um, conversation going there, and it's an interesting to throw, thing to throw up. So we connected our live and online experience very simply through SoundCloud. We tagged all the online content with a performance of the play by RSC actors. It was very simple, but we just wanted just a very simple page where you could experience the play and then see all that beautiful content come through. It doesn't all make sense, didn't all quite work. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It was an interesting place for us to explore to see what we could do. And it's what comes after. Some of the work that you do is what comes after it that's significant. What does it change? What does it make people do think differently? So I'm just going to 
let you think about this. The online platforms are bringing up new rituals and culture, and it's our rituals that in culture have changed. By working with Shakespeare's plays over 400 years, I'm able to look back at a canon of work to see <laughs> over time different societies and how they <coughs> worked and changed with theatre and performance, and I can get a sense of how that's changed over those years. In Elizabethan times, you'd perform a play, you'd have a really vocal audience, they'd be talking about it, they'd bring their food in, there'd be a connection between the actors, they might even talk to each other at some points. And then in Victorian times, that sensibility would change, and in Henry Irving's performances, it would be two farces and then a Shakespeare play, it'd be a night out, it'd be a huge event. And now, when you go to the theatre, if you go to the theatre, or if you go to a gallery, I'm just going to talk through what I think you might do. You've got a couple of tickets for the theatre, and you're taking a friend you haven't seen for ages. You've just finished work. You're in a bit of a rush, but you've met, you've agreed to meet for a glass of wine. You get there late, the tickets are in your bag, so you don't need to pick them up because you've done it all online. Um, you meet your friend, she's got a glass of wine there waiting for you. You down it quickly because you've got there just a few minutes before. Mm -hmm. Everyone's steaming to get in this room really, really late at the same time. It's all hustle and bustle. You've got your bag. Um, <coughs> the announcement comes up going, please turn off your mobile phones. There's an air of panic where people have gone, oh my God, I've turned off my mobile phone. <laughs> Rustling in your bag. And then even if you have turned off your mobile phone, you have to check again because you're paranoid because you don't want to be the person with the mobile phone going off. <laughs> And your friend's next to you, she's doing the same thing, you're not talking to each other, and then the lights go out. And you're together. And you're watching this play as one with strangers you don't know, and that's a ritual. And on the internet, we need to find the ritual for what we experience together. And that is the bit, I don't know yet how that's going to happen. And I think that as artists, let's think about that. Because it's not just showing your work. It's every bit that goes before seeing your work. It's every bit before it's a piece of artwork and you experience it. And we need to look together about what those new rituals are, what those new meeting points are. And that's why our audiences are important. Because we need to bring them with us. And we don't work in isolation. And I think I've done enough talking. Thank you. We have got a panel discussion at the end of the time, but um, we've got a bit of time before lunch, so if people have got some questions for Sarah, this would be a great time to ask them. Okay. I see one over there. Just a very simple one. What was the hashtag that you used to promote the uh, Dream 40, and, and 40 was the 40th time that we'd done the play. Uh, following this one, have you got, what have you got uh, ongoing and uh, developing? Um, we're going to do, it's the 400th anniversary of Shakespeare's death next year, so we've got quite a lot going on. Um, we're going to do Little Night's Dream again, but it's a play for the nation, so we're going on tour with the play, but amateurs will be performing the mechanicals, and it'll be a double build, so it'll be RSC plus Bradford Amateur Players, and through that we'll have an online presence with that, and we're hosting a national conversation, but expect bottom ears to come up and play for things like that. And I'm really looking forward to us um, working with someone that's been uh, uh, doing the love theatre hashtag campaigns and all that and bringing them into our world and hosting that conversation. <coughs> um, so there's lots going on, some of it I can't talk about, but, but all I will say is that the learning, yeah, a lot of little and some big ones, it's no longer one project, it's, 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 it's at the heart of what we do. Oh, Who <laughs> <laughs> first? Yeah. I think it's like Okay. Yeah, I just had a, a few comments about your what you were talking about, and then the first people talking and thinking about the original thing, and then all the copies. Yes. And how, in a way, you've bridged that. You've kind of you've welcomed <coughs> all the copies. Yes. Which operate in a really different way to, like you say, press and publicity images. Yes. Because they're not marketing. That's right. You've turned them into something a different kind of. Like you're saying, ritual or activity. Yes. That people are involved in, and how 
I'm sort of more familiar with the problem, in a sense, of user-generated content. Yes, content, yes, yes. And how that's <coughs> often unwaged, but used by corporations, yes. in a sense. So no, I completely agree, and we were really upfront about that. I think the most important thing is to be honest. You know, if a corporate... So we didn't make any money over this piece, and that was really important. There were no, t no ticket sales even. If we had, that would have changed the, the relationship, and that's not what it was about for us. We were asking to do something together. And, and that's why it was really important to talk to equity about it, and it was really important to talk to the artists. And if the artists didn't feel comfortable doing it, they didn't have to do it. But I do think there's something about the internet around people uploading their own content and really good content. And so from our perspective, this piece was going, as an institution, we don't see that as inferior. And we see this as a coming together. Um, I think if we make money out of it, I don't think that would have been the right nuance for it. So it's about an honesty, honesty of why. No, but I think your yeah your your question of trying to identify those rituals. Is yeah, really, really interesting. We I'm have, always, yeah. I mean, I'm sort of much. I sort of feel like I'm not one of those digital natives, and I'm constantly trying to work out what, stu what my students are doing, like all yeah. the time. I know, <laughs> and like, we got to we got to just accept that. Yeah. I think that's okay. <laughs> like we're the questioning area where we go, what is this? And then you've got, I mean, my son, he's, he's, only, he's only little, and they're just the, just the sort of agile what, is I know, just tell phenomenal. you what to do. They, I mean, my kids as well, they tell me how to sort of, you know, save, save memory space on my computer, you know. There you go. Yes. Handy, though. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> I just, again, it's no your strengths. It's like, I don't know, and I won't know what a code or a program, but you know what, I don't know what, uh, how, I don't know how to act, but I work with the best actors. And I would say, you don't need to know everything, just work with the best people and make, it's a, you know, it's an intuition there and you have strengths through your experience, through you knowing, that's what I was trying to say about the themes and, and the questions that you ask are universal human themes. It's not about presenting me with a solution. I want to find someone brilliant to work with that I can do something I can't do. So I would say we need, to, we need to not be so hard on ourselves in that sense. If we don't know, it doesn't matter. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, awkward. You go. <laughs> Very quick question. How long did you have to put a Shakespeare um, web page up? And that persona kind of going? Uh, we did it about six to eight weeks yeah. in advance. Was you? No. God, I didn't have time for that. And I need to get something in their 20s for that. I wasn't, again, uh, I, wasn't, I was not the best person to be Billy Shakespeare. Um, but I got someone that was just really comfortable in that space, really confident, and people can smell out confidence. Yeah. And then the other question was the SoundCloud. Yeah. Did you produce that <coughs> kind of immediately after you'd done the... Shortly time? after. Yeah. 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 It wasn't like live. No, God, no. Yeah. Didn't, yeah, no. no. Shortly after, don't. <laughs> Could you just say a little bit more about the weekend that took forever? And yeah. What, what that was? Uh, it was, um, so basically, it was on, online the hashtag, and you could follow the hashtag, or you went to a web page where there were like, it was like a dashboard where there were worlds of the plays which were lovers, court, mechanicals, and fairies. Um, fairies were really popular online, just to say. <laughs> Fairy thing, putting fairies, brilliant. Um, and but then in the live sense in Stratford upon Avon, we um, programmed performance times on the Friday night and the Sunday morning, and then in the afternoon we did like a fete and a, a wedding. We actually did a wedding, and then at midnight with the final scenes, we we performed that outside in our in our. We've got some beautiful grounds, and that was just really magical. And we got the so the Saturday was process. Saturday, nothing happened. Okay. Um, it was all online, but that because we made the rules up about the play, that was that was the rule, so we can stick with it. We had meetings about when fairy time started, <laughs> midnight, just in case you're wondering. <laughs> uh, so, so yeah, we, we have if we if you create the rules, then yeah. Oh, Lordy, okay. <laughs> Obviously, a midsummer night streaming was a very sort of specific yes. for a specific aims. But how does the RSC generally feel about people tweeting <laughs> during performances or taking pictures? Or is that changing? Not really. Well, I suppose it's like this, isn't it? It's kind of like that was a brilliant experiment, but uh, 
and for the right thing you do it again but it, at the moment it's still mobile phones off and there is something brilliant about turning your mobile phone off you know and um, so I don't I don't think it was more the the social angle for me it was what it was about people's cut of broadcasting so we talk about broadcasting our work but actually on social media we're broadcasting all the time and that was I think the more of the point in it but also to say we can't say we haven't done it so if we are ever in those meetings, we can say, well, actually, we haven't done it. So it won't be a first anymore, which I think is important. If, if that were to change, we can say we have. Do you think you'll incorporate, end up incorporating some of what you learned from that? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And it comes really quietly. And I think you can't... Real success isn't a <coughs> showboating about that. Real success to me is someone who are some of the quiet innovators in our team taking it and using it for themselves. So you kind of have to let it go. Hello. Hi, did you um, look at any kind of tangible figures in terms of your audience? Yes, we did. So did, it, did it yes, it did, increase? yeah. So the stats were, we increased our, our social media presence on Google 730%. <laughs> I know! Um, so just in with that, absolute push you can get that investment the, the what i will benchmark that with is that you have to then keep it up at that to keep that level you know so you can't just assume that you know once you've got that you can't go oh well i've done that now brilliant they're going to stay there they're not you've got to keep feeding feeding the beast um uh but uh well it's true isn't it um but uh what i was proud of um and where i think where we talk about potential of a networked culture and something that we didn't are still grappling with in terms of the realness of the statistic is that we reached about 30 million people through the hashtag on social media. We didn't just work one piece of content really hard, we have 3,000 pieces of content working very hard. Mm -hmm. And just think about that, don't, don't just create one piece of content that you're just pushing out there through a pipeline, think about your presence, think about all the different things and then the unification, the hashtag's great, it just unifies your brand or your your identity and, and allows you to re get that reach there. Do you use um, a different hashtag? Uh, no, just the same hashtag that weekend. Yeah. But what I liked about that is I just went, that's not footfall in our theatre. What that is about us thinking about circulation and putting that being outside <laughs> of our theatre and our, us being out there. So I think we've got more to think about there. I just, I just wondered about um, equity, you know, the union, and how yeah. I heard they're in really bad state. I don't know about that. I don't know. But no. then how, do they, how do they respond to this kind of... They responded rightly. They protect their actors, and we had a really good conversation about it, and they needed to understand it. We needed to make sure we were paying our actors we, we, uh, properly, which we always do. It's, we wouldn't do it if equity weren't happy with it, because mm. that's really important. So you're probably one of the few companies that actually still work with fully equity? I think our, our, we are an acting company. We come from a company of actors. Yeah. They're at the heart of what we do. And I think that, that yeah, I can't imagine us. I don't know anything about anything beyond that. Um, I don't deal in that part of the world at the theatre, but I think it's right that we have people asking us questions that represent mm -hmm. artists, absolutely. How has the life of the crossed over into the traditional theatre <coughs> show? Yeah. How did you so the actual. So do you mean? So well, subsequently. Oh, so subsequently, yeah. So okay, yeah. yeah. No, you're absolutely right. So um, I can't talk about it, but I can say that the next big thing I'll do will be on stage, and for me that is amazing because what that piece of work did was allow people to look, watch, see what was going on and not seeing a marginalisation of otherness about digital and over here. We are in the digital age, we are doing these things and to get an institution, to get it in its mainstream culture for me is success. So it's, it's about strategic innovation. So sometimes our work in institutions may be a bit confusing because we can't give you the, you know, the agileness but we're thinking about, we're thinking about culture change and if we can do that. So I hope that this work has become much more integrated. Mm -hmm.
and you won't need that D word mm. for much longer. You mentioned symptoms. I did. I wondered, do you broadcast live? Yes, we do. Okay, and how do you find that? Like, do you right. think it, no, but do you think it broaden the audience? Sorry. Does it broaden your audience, do you find, or do you think that you can incorporate the things I think you can always do more. Yeah. Always. And a lot of it, it's not about whether it's in the cinema, it's what content you put out there. Yeah. It's your programme, it's your artistic programme, and I think that <coughs> sometimes we'll come up going, this is the solution to your audience needs, and this is what you should be doing, and actually it's about your content, it's about who you're inviting in to be your directors, it's about who you're inviting in to be your creative team. In terms of our live cinema, it's been a it's been a really big success for us. We did one last night, um, and it's created a conversation. Um, it's also what it's also done is gone one night across the UK, maybe internationally. A lot of people come together to experience our work, like the ritual side of it. Um, but we can always do more to expand expand that. But um, I think it's. I think that it's going to be interesting to see where it goes in the next five years, and like, I think there's more to do. Sorry. Do you like change how it's viewed, like for the cinema audience compared to the theatre audience? Like, do you add e in extra things? No. Because, no, it's just like, no. Okay. No. We're pretty live on it actually. Oh. Yeah. I mean, other people might do it differently. I've heard other people might um, not do it, but the liveness bit's really important to us. Okay. Yeah. So we've got quite a. Uh, specialised team of people that are, you know, meticulously finding the best way to get the angles and the shots and things. And we spent a long time talking to our actors about it and making sure the company and things like makeup are different. Mm. Stage makeup is different to TV makeup. All those details. <coughs> You've heard about those performances. I haven't been to one, but they just sound incredible. But you can use different camera angles on a yeah. live performance, so it's like a film, but it's actually happening. Yeah, and some people really like the aesthetic of it, and some people still like the, the live, and I would say, you, you know, um, gives you more choice. Um, but yeah, I'm interested to see where it pushes. Um, I, are there more questions? I have one question I'm allowed to ask for. Um, you certainly are, Andrew. Um, so obviously a lot of theatre performances <coughs> about spectacle and drama and creating these kind of awe-inspiring experiences. Do you, how do you translate that onto a small sort of mobile phone screen? Or is there a way of kind of bringing that onto it? Oh, I, I think, yes, I think there is. I think that really good, I think it's finding the right actor or finding the right creative for this <coughs> platform, really. So what I mean by that, you could be the most dynamic stage actor and it's a different connection with the audience. It's sort of like with the live aspects in theatre, um, our artistic director has talked about this before, you can perform the line to yourself or you can use the audience around you to ask the audience the question so that the question in Rain and Juliet is not addressed just on stage, it's asking you. And suddenly this audience goes, no, don't do it, you know, that feeling like that. And I think the screen, we've got to, got to work out where the emotional connection is, how people are connecting to that. It is slightly different. Is different and it takes a different style, um, but I don't see why you can't, and you shouldn't think that you can't. It's just different. Does that answer the question? It does. It was a bit rambly there. <coughs> oh. Beyond the live cinema screens, do you think there will ever be a pay per view on the internet? Oh, God, yeah, long? I think so. Is that imminent? I, <laughs> I don't know. Um, What's that? Uh, pay per view. Pay per view. So I, I would, I would um, say. I would, I would, yes, I think that someone's going to do it, absolutely. And I think that's an interesting model. I think that um, the pay-per-view and the, like, you know, the times being a closed site and all that has affected people's reach. I still don't think people are very comfortable because the internet has been created as a, a free space. And that model is proving itself to, to work times after people are very sceptical about it. Yeah. Um, it will be work, it will work for different things. So some people will feel okay to pay for certain things. I think, and I think that that's going to be the sweet spot. Um, but I, I can't see it not coming. Great. Shall we wrap up there? Just say thank you. So.